back on the boulevard Thursday, March 28th. As always, here to prove to you, there is no such thing as football season. We are presented by the Believe Network tonight. I'm your host, Matty Fresh. And finally, football has come back into our lives. I I do miss when we only had a week between the Super Bowl and kickoff. But if this is what it took and this is what we had to sacrifice to get this UFL launched, I'm not complaining. If you've seen the show before, welcome back for season two. We need you more than ever to help us carry this XFL torch into this new merge. We don't forget where we came from here on the boulevard, exclusively covering the XFL last year, and now heading into a brand new landscape of professional spring football. These XFL players and coaches certainly don't forget where they came from either. Everybody seems like they have something to prove in this new rivalry. And the truth is, it's a rivalry that was always meant to be. Spring football wars where we don't have to compare ratings and rules. We could just hit each other until somebody comes out on top with the 2024 UFL championship. If you're new here tonight, maybe joining us on X or Facebook, where we're bringing the show multi-platform, not just YouTube this year, you could say hello to the director, the producer, and the owner of Studio Z. Back for season two, Chris Zuck. Season two, let's go. We're back, baby. Zuck, let's address the elephant in the room. You may have given it away, but for you, it's really all come down to this. After months of deliberation, after many sleepless nights, deciding what direction you would go with your spring football fanhood. Zook, your new team is? Nobody. Everybody against D.C. Seattle, ride or die. They're coming back. We'll see them in a, a year, maybe two. On tonight's show, I'm excited to be back in this chair, at least. Zook is not going to throw me off my game tonight. I promise you that. For the first time in over nine months, we have to deliver you a full episode and kickoff weekend is here. So as many of you have heard, the champ versus the champ is making headlines going into kickoff weekend between the Stallions and the Renegades. But on this show, that takes a backseat to America's team, the D.C. Defenders undefeated inside the confines of our nation's capital and back seeking blood after a brutal way to end last season. But they're ready for revenge, and that beer snake is ready to be scaled to the top of the Washington Monument. They'll have one week on the road before they return home. But we have Briley Moore, who's returning to D.C., ready to tell us about that squad. And, of course, it wouldn't be the Boulevard without our Week 1 Best Bets. Make sure to drop a like, subscribe to the channel. We are on X or Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube tonight in the live chat. So, let's take a quick look here at 2024 UFL title futures before we get into our game previews. These are current numbers on DraftKings Sportsbook. FanDuel also has some up as well as really wherever you get your odds. If you're on podcast, the Battlehawks are preseason co-favorites at plus 300. They are up there with the Stallions also at 3-1. to one. The D.C. Defenders plus 380. Arlington plus 550. Houston at plus 650. Memphis at 8-1. to one. Michigan at 13 to 1. And at the bottom, those Brahmas at 14 to 1 odds to win the UFF, UFL championship. 
So let's examine those for a second before we go into our game previews. I have a few thoughts. Um, Battle Hawks were in this position last season as well as the preseason favorite. It did not work out for them. They were 7-3, and three, but they missed the playoffs. Birmingham sitting up there at 3-1. to one. What do we think about that? My thought is it's the league's easiest schedule because they avoid trips to D.C. and St. Louis. So very manageable there. And maybe you're surprised to see the San Antonio Brahmas all the way at the bottom. Let me remind you, though, this is not a power ranking. It's not one through eight. This is about where odds makers believe teams will end up at the end of the season with a chance to make the playoffs. The XFL did not change the playoff format. It is going to be two squads from the XFL conference and two squads from the USFL conference. So naturally, it's going to be harder for San Antonio to crack that top two when they have a stacked conference. And if you don't believe me, take a glance at the back half of that San Antonio schedule. Arlington twice, a trip to D.C., a trip to St. Louis, and Birmingham at home. How many of those can you realistically win? It's going to be tough. But it's time to make it official at this moment. I am taking the D.C. Defenders plus 380 to win the 2024 UFL Championship. Whatever trophy they're going to give us. I know the USFL and XFL trophies differ. Probably going to make a new one. Whatever trophy it is, I'm locking it in. Plus 380. Get it wherever. You get your odds. I think Birmingham's a little overpriced. You might see them as a lock to get to the title game, which is fine. That's the likely outcome. But I guarantee by that point in the season, if they do get to the title game, they will not be favored against D.C. So that gets a little scary. And you might end up having to cash out for less if you're riding Birmingham. Again, you're going to look down the board at some of the more underdogs. I think Arlington is uh, is a good value play there as well. So that's our, our conversation about the 2024 UFL championship preseason odds with that said let's kick off ufl week one when dwayne the rock johnson stood on the 50 yard line at choctaw stadium last year rocking that baby blue number 54 that was the day the xfl was reborn and we should have all known at that point how things were going to end up because everything that the rock touches turns to gold And that certainly took a while for the Arlington Renegades, but they did end up with the 2023 XFL championship game. And now some are saying they've met their match. Enter the Birmingham Stallions, two-time USFL champs, galloping in with the most NFL draft picks on their roster by a long shot. The spread in this one favors the road Stallions by three and a half. The total sits at 42 and a half. And the forecast for this one says mid-70s, partly cloudy, with 10 to 20 mile an hour winds at kickoff. So let's start with big game Bob Stoops and that Renegades offense. This offense is now led by Chuck Long, who was co-OC here last year. So same system for the returning starting quarterback, Luis Perez, who was last year's XFL title game MVP. All the skill possession guys return for Perez headlined by tight end Sal Canella. And if you look at the newcomers, I think the Renegades really crushed this draft. They bring in all XFL wide receiver Deontay Burnett, who starred in Houston last year, and their number one pick was a home run. Do not sleep on quarterback Lindsey Scott Jr. He will not enter the season as the starter. I'm not suggesting that Perez will be benched, but there is no better athlete to have if you want that Kelly Bryant package that the Renegades featured at times last year. I do have questions about that, about that number one pick. How, how did Arlington end up with the number one pick of the draft? I mean, you're the league champ. That, that, don't make, that doesn't add up to me at all. I guess it was a trade with San Antonio, they said, during the season. Ended up being a great trade because you get the FCS Heisman out of it to back up Luis Perez, who, funny enough, was once the Division II Heisman. So quarterback room in very good hands in Arlington. The offensive line looks a lot different. Uh, Stoops has an endless list, though, of Oklahoma Sooners that he can just dial up at any time and retool with. He got a couple guys up front 
from Boomer Sooner. And that's really a summary of their offensive personnel, a ton of returning talent. So we try to find what's the potential edge for Chuck Long's offense against a Birmingham defense led by John Chavis, who is a longtime SEC defensive coordinator. And on paper, this unit is scary. It's loaded. Some key guys here, Taco Carlton, former first-round NFL draft pick out of Michigan. DeMarquise Gates is back from the Chicago Bears. He was once a stallion. He's a, a stud spring league veteran at the linebacker spot. And Kenny Robinson anchoring that secondary. He was a safety for the XFL Battlehawks back in 2020. Um, so kind of hard to get a read on the Birmingham defense week one because they do only return, I think, three or four starters from 2023. But it really does look like a, an all-star team that kind of reloaded with that fringe NFL talent. Great job there by the young GM, Zach Potter. So final verdict for me on the Renegades offense versus the Stallions defense. I still, and I know I'm going to get pushback. I, I, everyone's all over Birmingham. They're running to the counter. They're betting this spread. They're betting Birmingham futures. Listen, if we learned anything last year. It's about continuity right and I know the stallions have that under this staff but if you look up and down the roster and just the personnel it's a lot of new faces will they gel for Arlington I feel like there's nobody better at executing a play script than Luis Perez the run game was iffy at times last year I think it'll stay probably about the same but the wide receivers got better you got Sal Canella. And Lindsey Scott Jr. is basically Kelly Bryant evolved. So Stallion's D solid, and, and so is Coach Chavis, but slight lean to Perez and the Arlington O being able to get the job done here. Now we flip sides of the ball. We want to look at the Birmingham offense against that Arlington Renegade defense. To me, this is the headliner of the matchup. You got the Skip Holtz offense against the Jay Hayes defense. Is anybody else as fired up as me to see Matty Corral back on a football field? What a signing for Birmingham. I'm just going to give it to you straight, guys. If, if Matt Corral is healthy and playing his best ball, he's the most dangerous quarterback in the UFL, and that's because of his wheels. His last season at Ole Miss back in 2021, 11 rushing touchdowns for Corral led to him being a high round draft selection to the Panthers. And if you know Matt Corral, he does not slide. He will take guys on head on. And he's also got something in common with A.J. McCarron and a few other quarterbacks in this league, including Jordan Tamu. He did it against SEC defenses in college at the highest level of college football. Corral and the Stallions could be the perfect marriage. I know a ton of Ole Miss fans are going to cross over to Birmingham fans down there in the Deep South. And if the 25-year-old can play the same way he did at Ole Miss, I think he has a pretty deep receiving core to be a star in this league. For the receiving core, to me, the headliners of the room are Deion Kane and Benjamin Victor, who some of you will remember out of Ohio State. He broke my heart back in college when he came to Penn State and, and took a touchdown to the house my senior year. Just a brutal loss for the Nittany Lions, all because of Benjamin Victor. And I also love kind of what the Stallions will be able to do in 12 personnel looks. So the one running back and the two tight end set with Jay Sternberger and Jordan Thomas, who was with Orlando last year, and with them two potentially out there at the same time, and a nice tailback in C.J. Marable. Marable's actually one of only three or four returning starters on the offensive side of the ball for Skip Holtz. But I don't think that matters because the theme for Birmingham this year wasn't about bringing back a bunch of guys with that championship run. It was about reloading. They got all these fringe NFL types and even proven USFL commodities, and they can really run up against a brick wall with this Arlington defense if they don't gel right away. Uh, this Arlington front seven, LaRon Stokes, is all XFL, Devontae Lambert, all XFL, Donald Payne, one of the best linebackers in the league last season, 
and they added former first-round pick Vic Beasley from the Vegas Vipers. It is stacked for Jay Hayes' defense. They return eight starters on that side of the ball. So for me, it's all going to come down to the quarterback play for the visitors. I know there's been some chatter about Adrian Martinez, maybe in some running packages. But to me, you don't really have to go with Martinez because you have that running ability with Matt Corral, who did it in college. And with Arlington, Luis Perez doesn't scramble much. So having Lindsey Scott Jr. offsets the Luis Perez and being able to do different things. I do think Matt Corral will rush for a ton of yards in this game because he'll be running for his life. But give me the Arlington Renegades, the XFL champions, straight up to start 1-0 at home. Zook, take it away. I'm going the other way. I'm taking Birmingham. Great start for us. Well, <laughs> if we don't disagree, Big are surprise. We, we dis- are, yeah, wow. Are, are we really doing it? I mean, uh, Birmingham's cream of the crop. Uh, favored uh, for championship last year, pretty much right out of the gate, the whole way. Um, straight up, I like them. I kind of like the spread, too. A little lean, but... I don't know. I Birmingham, to me, has the most to prove. We talked about that uh, on the show earlier this week, and I think they're going to come out with some fire. I think uh, Arlington's going to take a little championship uh, slump here. Yeah, and if you think about this one, it's not really a road game for Birmingham. Again, we want to remind people that the UFL hub is in Arlington, Texas, so no travel required here for Birmingham. They've been practicing in the city. And when it comes to the stallions, it's just about, will they have enough returning guys and will they have enough chemistry? I think at some point in the season, that system is really going to start to click, especially in their conference games. But week one, watch out for big game, Bob. I think Luis Perez comes out slinging it and I'm going to go Arlington. I was shocked. They were a three and a half point dog. You're giving me three and a half points with the champs. So that's the first game. We got a doubleheader on Saturday, which is going to take us to Detroit Rock City, another XFL, USFL crossover game. And when you think about this one being one of 16 crossover games between the XFL and USFL this season, go ahead, drop a chat. How many do you think the XFL wins of those crossover matchups? I know that's going to be a highly debated topic. I'm somewhere in the 15 to 16 range. I think 15 is kind of the floor, 16 probably the ceiling for the XFL against the USFL this year. Battlehawks, Panthers, the spread favors St. Louis by six and a half. This total sitting at 42 and a half, same as the last game. And a forecast familiar for St. Louis fans who are also inside, inside Ford Field at Michigan. So. This will be the XFL statement game of the weekend when it comes to Birmingham and Arlington being very close and you being able to tell those teams are evenly matched. This is where there's a considerable gap on paper between the Battle Hawks and the Panthers. And really, it all starts with A.J. McCarron. The the Battle Hawks offense and the Panthers defense could be a pretty good matchup, but Bruce Bratt got Bratt. We are starting off strong here, Zook. Bruce Gradkowski, that's enough syllables for me tonight, is back to work with A.J. McCarron, and that's really bad news, I think, for the rest of the UFL because you look at St. Louis, their fifth and sixth receivers, I think, could start on the rest of these UFL squads. Uh, It's no surprise, A.J. actually said recently that one day he wants to take over the head coaching reins for the St. Louis Battlehawks. Um. So his agenda has got to be clear this year, right? Play so damn good that Anthony Beck is going to get college and NFL looks, and maybe AJ will be able to retire, hop in there, and, and become a head coach. Wouldn't that be something for St. Louis? Uh, yeah, Bruce, Bruce and AJ are going to be co-coordinators this year for sure. And for my money, this is a team that's going to air it out even more than they did in 2023, which was a lot. Uh, we're taking bets on who's going to emerge as wide receiver one for the Battlehawks. You got Jacor Pearson out for half the season with a knee injury. So 
It's really down to Hakeem Butler, Darius Shepard, Marcel Aitman, and Blake Jackson over from Seattle. I think really all those guys are capable of being uh, AJ's favorite target, but Hakeem Butler is the one to me who separates himself from that group. They also add Wayne Gallman, who kind of directly replaces the tailback from last year, Brian Hill. They were both fourth-round picks in the NFL, both kind of vet guys who can be utilized in the pass game and can also pick up the, the pass rushers that A.J. is going to be facing this year in that pocket. Um, for the offensive line in St. Louis, all XFL, Penn State Nittany Lion, Steven Gonzalez. Got to get him on the show at some point this year. He's back all XFL to anchor that offensive line. They, they return pretty much everybody. I don't even have to run through the names. That line is very solid. And they'll be tasked with stopping a couple really solid pass rushers from the Michigan Panthers. Breland Speaks is a guy we think about. Kenny Willekes from the home state. He used to play for Sparty. And Frank Ginda, the real deal on that Michigan defense. I do think they get a few sacks on Saturday afternoon, but it's just going to be an uphill battle, especially when you consider this is A.J. McCarron going against a first-year defensive coordinator in Colin Bauer for the Panthers. That's you imagine that's your first test. You got that receiving core to deal with and the UFL preseason MVP favorite. So let's switch focus a bit to the Michigan offense. Mike Nolan hired Marcel Belfay away from the Philadelphia Stars to be the OC. Donnie Abraham is the defensive coordinator for the St. Louis Battlehawks. So those are the two coordinators that will be taking each other on Saturday afternoon. Um, fun fact, actually, when it comes to the coaches, uh, the head coaches in this one, Mike Nolan and Anthony Becht, were once together with the New York Jets back in the year 2000. Mike Nolan was the D.C. there, and Anthony Becht was a draft pick, a young tight end. That was a cool tidbit from uh, – Stully that we found in those those awesome St. Louis game notes that, that he delivers every week. Uh, Belfay, the new offensive coordinator here for Michigan, is known for the air raid. So we'll see who they go with at quarterback. You've got the Ivy League EJ Perry and the SEC Danny Etling. Very contrasting styles there. And that's really a toss-up with, with some favoring Etling um, as, uh, as the, the QB1. Again, just another reason I'm going to play St. Louis here. The uncertainty at the quarterback position for Michigan is the last thing you need when you're going against XFL Defensive Player of the Year, Pita Talmo Penu. That's not going to be easy for a two-quarterback system, although Etling does have some wheels. I remember him showing them off in college and also with the Green Bay Packers in preseason action. Uh, Wes Hills is the tailback here for Michigan, and he's going to make that offense go. He led the USFL in rushing last year. And actually another kid out of Slippery Rock. We're seeing a few Slippery Rock guys coming out to the UFL. Sink you, Sweeting. Guys some remember from Vegas last year. Uh, highlighting that Battlehawks defense is Tamu Penu and, of course, Austin Fiolu, who comes over from Seattle. We're actually calling them the Battle Dragons this year, Zook. I mean, I counted eight Seattle Sea Dragons on – the defensive side of the ball for St. Louis. So that that Sea Dragons defense that was headlined by uh, Zook's uncle Ron Zook, it's going to be uh, is going to be a big Seattle influence. Uh, when you think more about this defense, I, I feel like the trip to the dome last April for Seattle kind of made Anthony Beck open his eyes a little bit, and, and how Seattle was able to shut down AJ McCarron that day. What did he do? He went out and got all those guys on his side now. So kind of a scary defensive situation that secondary was suspect last year. They needed to shore that up. And Michigan has some real deal wide receivers that they could potentially exploit that. But overall, Zook, I'm super heavy on the St. Louis Battlehawks here, and I don't think it's going to be close. Good value at six and a half. Um, I, I would lean over here as well. But we're scared of those in week one. Uh, obviously, this league with its rules cater to the over with the three-point conversions as well as the uh, alternate onside kick. Who you got in this one, Zook? I also have St. Louis. I, well, one for one. Chalk we agree. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I think you're right. If I'm going to lean, I'm liking that over, too. I'm, it's not a best bet of mine because I don't like yeah. totals. I really don't. Uh, but it's, it's definitely, you would think week one, defenses might be a little slow. How much yeah. tackling have they really been do- doing? And uh, that St. Louis offense is nasty. So Yeah, th- this scares me with St. Louis as potentially the team that comes out in week one and we know already who the champ's going to be. Uh, they are going to make a statement. They, they put up 53 last time they were on a field. The defense was not good, but you give A.J. another year with Bruce, and you get some defensive players like that, St. Louis is going to start 4-0, and then they're going to go to D.C. and lose. That's going to be how their season goes. <laughs> so... We will have a pair of Easter Sunday showdowns to look at next, but before we do, enjoy our chat with Defenders tight end Briley Moore. Drop us a like, subscribe to the channel to hear from more UFL stars throughout the season. From KCMO to the campus of Northern Iowa, where he began his college career with the Panthers, then on to the Power 5 level at Kansas State. All Big 12 selection at the tight end position. Welcome to Spring Ball Boulevard. Two-year D.C. defender, tight end, Briley Moore. What's going on, Briley? Good to have you, man. What's happening? I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Of course. And, uh, man, I got to start. I I still can't figure out how the hell did you catch that ball in Orlando (laughs) last year from De'Eric King? And was that the craziest catch of your career? Uh, That just the whole play in general, watching it back, like, after the game, I mean, yeah, first, that was probably the craziest catch in, in my career. Um, shout out to the XFL for having the one one foot down rule. Um, I didn't realize it during the game how crazy Dierks throw uh, was until after the game. And I seen it on uh, I seen it on ESPN and stuff. And I mean, that was unreal the way he flipped his hips around the opposite way. And then um, I mean, he really put it in the breadbasket. It wasn't wasn't a crazy, crazy catch. Um, for me, because he he made it he made it so easy, but I'm glad I was able to get that foot down and uh and get a cool one in. And they're doing two this year, right? Got to get two down now. I think they they changed the rule yep. on us. They're they're not talking about they, that rule change as down. much as some of the others, but I think players are going to find out uh, week one that they got to get two in. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Briley. Well, you're one of 28 guys that are back on this DC Defender squad. Most returning players in the league. It looks like a really strong core coming back. What was different about camp this year compared to last year when, you know, openly some guys said there were fights and, and kind of some issues gelling at first? Absolutely. So this year, you know, having that core group, um, and I mean, shout out to, to Vaughn um, and Coach Barlow for being able to, you know, bring back such a core group um, of guys and then add you know, awesome pieces um, to it to really gel it. But yeah, just having that core group of guys that have been here and know how things um, run in the DC organization, um, you know, knowing how to control practice that we go, we go pretty hard. We practice, we practice hard, we practice physical. Um, That's how we play too. So it works. Um, But just kind of having that, that core group um, that really knows how things are done here. It's been a much smoother process. Um, We're not fighting, you know, throughout camp like we did last year. We're, you know, we're really pushing each other. Um, iron sharpens iron when it comes to offense versus defense, and and we were just getting better, and uh, obviously, obviously uh, and also getting to know one another, um, which was big, you know, early on, and and things started clicking throughout camp um, towards the end, like they were supposed to. So, um, it's it's really good to be able to have those returning guys. Yeah, and of course, it's a big year of changes. Year of changes in this transition from the XFL to the new UFL. Your position coach, Cody Krill taking a job at Marshall where he'll coach the offensive line. And listen, he was best tight end coach in the league, right? That, that tight end room was for real last season. What is that lead? What does that leadership look like without Cody in the tight end room now? Yeah. So it's cool to be able to have um, myself and um, skit Alex Ellis back as well as uh, Trey Barry, our long snapper. Um, So there's really only one new guy um, in Caden Smith. So we kind of, you know, we're used to, to how Coach Krill ran things for us. Um, and like you said, he's an unbelievable coach. He deserves to be at that level. Um, so, you know, we're able to, to bring a lot of the, the things that he implemented and the leadership that he had 
um, in because we do have have a core um, three or four guys uh, that were here with him. So awesome for him. Um, super excited for him. You know, he's he's a cool dude. He actually stopped by practice the other day. Um, so it was, a, it was good to see him for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, we majority same coaches and stuff like that. So his leadership's missed. Um, but, you know, we're, we're trying to hold up uh, our end of the bargain to, to keep it there. Yeah, that that Fred Kais uh, coaching connection is kind of cool when you look back and you look at Coach Huff at Marshall and he worked for Coach Kais and now yep. Coach Krill was on that staff and just a ton of assistants that, you know, Coach Kais been around for a while and he's gotten to know a lot of guys and, and, and through the HBCU ranks. So that's cool to see that continuity. And I was ashamed to see Absolutely. some of the XFL assistants that weren't able to stay on and, you know, everything kind of getting cut down this year. But which and Coach Krill, the absolute best with the thundering herd there in West Virginia. Yeah. Um, you talk about Caden Absolutely. Smith. You talk about Caden Smith a little bit. Obviously, from a returning standpoint, you and Jordan both back. You talk about Alex Ellis as well. Brandon Smith, another guy I think about. But a lot of new faces in this past game. You mentioned Caden Smith, who started about a year and a half in the NFL. And then you got some shiny new receivers as well with Kiki QT and uh, Vincent Smith, who were both NFL guys for the last three or four years. How's that receiving core shaping up in camp without the Lucky Jacksons and the Chris Blair and even Ethan Wolf, a guy who had some success last year? Absolutely. Obviously, we're, you know, from last year's receiver room to this year's receiver room, we lost two guys to the NFL, another starting guy um, to a coaching job um, in the NFL. So those are big shoes to fill. Um, but I'm excited um, for Sunday so everybody can see this receiving room that we have. I mean, these guys, they're, they're the, the real deal. Um, they've been showing out since we got here. You mentioned, obviously, Kiki. Um, Chris Rowland's another guy that's been super consistent for us and making big plays. Um, and, you know, we, we got quite a few, quite a few good, uh, good people in that room that I'm excited to see them um, have success because I really do think they're going to. Uh, and, you know, we'll see, see how they, they fare up to last year. Obviously, you know, we're not comparing ourselves to the past. It's, you know, it's a new year. It's a whole new league. Um, but I think that receiving room is, is going to surprise some people because I know there's a lot of question marks on the outside looking in with the guys that we lost. Yeah, and if I know Von Hutchins, he's he's not here to rebuild. He's here to reload. <laughs> uh, immediately uh, started working when it when it came to replacing some of these guys and, and got Jordan back, Absolutely. which is ultimately the key to the offense. Uh, let's get into San Antonio a little bit. Uh, this is basically last year's roughneck squad that you guys beat. Um, from a scheme perspective, I know they do have a lot of returning guys from the Brahmas that you saw last year as well, but that Phillips three, four is basically what we're looking at here for that Brahmas mm -hmm. defense. What have you guys been kind of focusing on in your prep and outside of Abram, which is obviously the heartbreaking news coming into camp. How's everyone holding up health wise? Yeah, I mean, everybody's pretty good. Um, you know, I, I would say that our whole team's healthy. Everybody's running around pretty good. Guys that were banged up are getting back on the field. Um, obviously, it sucks, you know, to lose <laughs> to lose that guy wearing number four, um, you know, the best back in the league last year. And, you know, a lot of our offense ran through him. Even our passing game ran through, you know, what he could do. Um, but I'm excited to be able to get out there whenever, you know, talking about San Antonio. Yeah, we're watching a lot of, la of last year's film. Um, Wade Phillips, you know, a legendary coach. So we're watching a lot of things that they did last year with the Roughnecks. I'm expecting very similar things. I know they do have a new DC, um, you know, so you never know what's really going to happen. Um, but I, you know, feel pretty good on, you know, just different things that we're doing right now to implement into the game um, this year based off, you know, what we've seen them do last year um, and three years past pretty consistently. Yeah, it's really cool to see uh, three returning starters on that offensive line as well to complement you and Alex coming back in the tight end room. I think that was one of the most overlooked position groups as far as guys that didn't get enough credit paving the way for that that elite run game. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, you guys. So you guys scrimmaged Michigan, right, from the USFL side. Um, I kind of want your opinion on, on something so far, and I've been asking a couple of players this that I've had the chance to talk to uh, about some of the all USFL guys that are getting cut around the league on different teams. Uh, it's kind of a two school, mm -hmm. two different schools of thought that I have. In your opinion, for those guys that are getting cut, is it because their teams didn't make the merge? They had to get redrafted, come back into a new system, and immediately play catch up for three weeks of training camp? Or have you noticed a talent gap between the XFL side and the USFL side? Yeah, I mean, obviously both 
both sides were talented. So, you know, I won't say that it was a talent, talent gap. You know, I do think that we'll, I'm excited to see how, you know, each uh, conference this year uh, matches up though. Um, that'll be something interesting to watch throughout the season. Really. I think it's, you know, whenever you cut, you know, four teams from, from their division, really kind of five with, um, the way some of it happened and then you know guys are having to play catch up and you know then you know like we have a lot of returner guys so if somebody were to come over to our team and you know they're playing catch up on a greg williams defense who i played against them all last year and i still don't know what to expect whenever we're out there um you know so it, it makes it hard and I, I do think that's it so i'm excited to see if there's expansion in the future um obviously you know i've seen on twitter that there is um, cause there's a lot of guys, you know, looking at the guys that got cut, there's a lot of guys that deserve to be playing football, um, and being able to showcase what they got. So, um, definitely excited for that. Definitely hope that that happens. Um, but it does suck, you know, guys missing out on opportunities and stuff like that. But it is interesting whenever you look, I, I couldn't be wrong on this. I was just looking at Twitter. It was something like 15, all USFL guys got cut. That's crazy, um, to think about compared to only one, um, XFL. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully, wish those guys the best. Hopefully, they can get on the squad whenever there's expansion or throughout the season because obviously, injuries, injuries are a big thing. Yeah, and there's guys on both sides of that. I, I do kind of feel for the guys who had their teams cut because it is really tough to make a roster then. But you look at a success story, a guy like Chris Rowland comes from the stars, doesn't have a home. All of a sudden, he's a DC defender, makes the 50 man roster. So, uh, there's certainly guys, even on the XFL side, you think about a uh, Deontay Anderson on the defense now, guy out of Vegas. Uh, earns a starting yep. spot at safety uh, over a couple of guys who who started last year for you guys. So it's definitely possible uh, if you have a good camp. And, uh, yeah, injuries will ultimately happen, and a lot of these guys are going to be on waivers and, and ready to suit up week two and, and beyond. Um, so that's Absolutely. that. I had to ask you, Briley, before we go here, and I really appreciate your time coming on the show, some trivia here to end it. Which UFL team has never lost a home game in franchise history? franchise history you know this one man don't overthink DC. it dc baby let's go see i, I just want to remind everybody of that <laughs> coming into this season <laughs> dc has not lost back to the 2020 xfl when you were in uh manhattan <laughs> balling out for kansas state dc was yep. winning games in front of that crowd yep. that crowd is going to be fired up man week two sold out last couple games of the season last year and coming in with some real momentum and some unfinished business that is Briley Moore, tight end for the D.C. Defenders. Thank you for joining us today, Briley. Really appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate your time. I'm telling you guys, we are building the beer snake to the top of the Washington Monument this season. I want it sold out every week at Audi Field for guys like Briley who are going to be hyping the place up. I cannot wait. I saw a promo today from the ticket department. $20 for college students in the DMV area. Get out there. Take the Metro. It's 20 bucks. That, <laughs> that section has, a, has a, the beer snake section, has the, the college student section kind of vibe. I promise you, if you're an undergrad, that is the most fun place to be on Sundays in the spring. Thank you, Briley Moore. That was a great interview. He really has a good chance to emerge as tight end one for D.C., this year it's the unfinished business tour for reggie barlow and company in the alamo city on easter sunday where the 28 returning members of the dc defenders will be all too familiar with the alamo dome turf in which they lost a chance to win an xfl championship in their last game it's defenders brahmas the spread favoring dc by six Totals a nudge higher than our Saturday games at 44 and a half. And the forecast is really whatever Wade Phillips wants to set the thermostat at when he becomes the first guy in the building. He'll probably be there at 4 a.m. Knowing, knowing Coach Wade. Uh, so looking at this one, a fresh start of sorts for OC Fred Kais and quarterback Jordan Tamu. Not a single starter back across any of the skill positions outside of quarterback. So the heartbreaking news for D.C. fans and this team was the loss of Abram Smith to a torn ACL in camp. Uh, really just speechless on the effect that that will have. Um, and, and really, D.C. also having to replace Lucky Jackson, 
Chris Blair and Josh Hammond, who were their top three receivers in this scheme last year. But, guys, this is what happens when you're the best, when you're the standard, when you're Von Hutchins putting this roster together. You are going to see turnover. You're going to have guys picked up in the NFL. A lot of you Battlehawk fans, you know, you're you're yelling caca at me, telling me, look at all the NFL guys we got. Well, I'm pretty sure you have your wide receiver one and two back. Must be nice. Can't relate. Our guys are on to the NFL. Shout out to Lucky and Chris doing their thing. Uh, wish, <laughs> wish we had them back. But we, we, we instead focus on who are the prime candidates to replace those guys. My front runner for wide receiver one in D.C. this year is a guy who also made the all-name team in the UFL, and that is Kiki QT. Can't wait to say that one in the highlight show. And he's a Texas Tech product, so you know he got a ton of targets in college. He was also a, a big-time kick returner in the Big 12. I also think Brandon Smith is another guy who, who will fit this scheme well coming back from last year. He was kind of the wide receiver four and, and, and had a good second half of the season. Um, the O-line is going to be the strength for Fred Kice's offense yet again. Three starters back up front, and those guys were super underrated last year. Uh, you look at that running attack, you give a lot of credit to Abram Smith, of course, but that offensive line, they were highlighted by some national outlets as far as some of the run-blocking schemes that they had and they were able to execute. So the focus will really shift to who's going to tote the rock for D.C.? Uh, I think it's Cam Harris and Darius Higgins. In week one, with a little bit of a carry share, we'll see who emerges between those two guys, Harris, the returner, and Higgins, the newcomer, out of Virginia State, where Reggie Barlow was a head coach for a long time. So they're going up against that Phillips 3-4, and it's it's the son of bum, Wade Phillips, back in a new color scheme after he just handed uh, San Antonio two losses last season in this, this little Texas rivalry when he was with Houston. He becomes a Brahma, and listen, Wade Phillips is where God intended him to be, and that's coaching football in the state of Texas. It's always a great, great marriage there. Uh, His defensive coordinator, Brian Stewart, moves on to coach at Middle Tennessee. Congratulations to Coach Stewart for that job. So enter Will Reed, who's a longtime Wade Phillips disciple, and Reed has some things going for him. When you think about this, uh, San Antonio's front seven, to me, is probably the second best in the league on paper behind D.C., of course, they have all XFL returnees across the board. Delonte Scott, Jordan Williams, and you throw in guys like uh, Tavante Beckett and Tim Ward over from Houston. And then you have Kavion Patton, the big nose tackle up front. He was an all XFL guy with Orlando. So a scary front seven in that 3-4 defense. But remember, D.C. got the better of Houston on Monday night football in 2023 and they put up a lot of points in the process so some sour taste in the mouth of that roughneck staff that night because they were coming in really strong to that game i'm sure that greg williams matchup with aj smith is going to be awesome overall between the dc offense and the san antonio defense to me it's a wash i don't know about the dc offense yet it's a great scheme jordan is fine. It's just going to be a lot of weight on his shoulders. He's probably going to be running around a lot. So if you like really all the rushing yard overs for the quarterbacks, I know sacks are tough. I wouldn't take it for McCarron and Perez, but for a guy like Tamu and a guy like Corral, I like the rushing yards over if they put the uh, player props up or if you're looking at DFS as well. Um, In the trenches, this will be a battle. DCO line, San Antonio D line probably could give us game of the week type potential one of these running backs or wide receivers is going to have to step up ultimately Uh, for the DC defense. Greg is back. Greg Williams, baby is as his, uh, his player, uh, Reggie Northrup would say he's back ready to kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer. That is the defenders mentality. And you can imagine this front seven might create some problems for AJ Smith and those San Antonio Brahmas and his new quarterback who I'm shocked isn't Quentin Dormady. Chase Garbers getting the start. And if you look up uh, California quarterback in the dictionary, you're going to see a picture of Chase Garbers. He, he just, he looks the part of a Cali kid. Uh, and he got high praise from his offensive coordinator, actually comparing his skill set to PJ Walker, PJ Walker. You guys remember him? That's our savior. 
we, we love watching PJ back in 2020. That that's the guy. So so high praise and I don't know. That's like to me saying Caleb Williams is Pat Mahomes. We don't know yet. Pump the brakes on that comparison. But hey, nobody knows these quarterbacks like AJ Smith, right? That's that that's a guy who knows his quarterbacks well. I'm looking forward to the uh the the GTFO play calls coming back, especially on Easter Sunday. I mean, can you imagine you get home from church on Easter Sunday and, and AJ Smith's up in the booth in a spring football game? You're probably thinking you're gonna turn on bowling on a Sunday on ESPN in March. Instead, you get AJ Smith. GTFO, GTFO. I got the over two and a half on, on the GTFO play calls. Um a lot of people will say that Greg Williams play calling and how aggressive it is might have cost DC uh, a championship last year. Let me be clear. I'm not one of those people. I think you got to be aggressive. Uh, we just heard Briley Moore say Greg's throwing looks at them and, and, and that they don't even recognize. So he will do things. AJ McCarron has told us he likes to disguise coverage and, and, and play mind games. And, and you know how Greg Williams is like he, He's not messing around coming into this one. And this is a big time matchup. So DC returns 10 starters on defense. They add XFL sack leader Trent Harris as the 11th. Tim Ward got cut from this team, guys. Tim Ward got cut and picked up by San Antonio the next day. That shows you how loaded this defense is. Chase Garbers, man. He's going to have to run. Run for his life. I don't think San Antonio's offensive line can match up with DC's front seven. And if they have any chance of, of pulling this upset, it, it's going to have to be uh, Chase Garbers because I don't know how much time he's going to have to have to throw the ball. He's going to have to run it sometimes. Um, I've been impressed with San Antonio's upgrades at the skill positions. Really sneaky running back room here. I think John Lovett is probably the best back they have. He was with Vegas last year. was huge on him as a guy you can use in the pass game, the leap that he's going to take with A.J. Smith's scheme is going to be amazing as a kind of an out-of-the-backfield receiver. They also got Bryce and Aline over from Houston and Anthony McFarland, who, who's no stranger to the black and yellow. He was a Pittsburgh Steeler the last four seasons. A mega-talented wide receiver room. I mean, you got John Trey Kirkland back after his season was cut short. In Kirkland, you have basically Justin Jefferson Jr., I mean, he is he is essentially the Justin Jefferson of the UFL. He played with, with, with J.J. at LSU, and he learned a lot, including that gritty. And, and he could throw the ball. We saw him throw a touchdown pass last year before he got hurt. So, so watch out for those A.J. Smith wrinkles. Uh, Marquez Stevenson, KD Cannon, deep threats. If Garbers can put it on the money, Stevenson and Cannon might be the fastest two receivers in the, in the UFL. They're that scary. And you top it off with Cody Latimer, who is the best tight end in spring football. No questions asked. Um, I'm still going to give the edge to that D.C. defense here. And, and it's because the pass rush could eliminate all those options for Garbers that I just talked about. He could be under duress all day. I, I don't trust this offensive line for San Antonio. And D.C. at times struggled with the pass last year. We know they, I think, ended up the worst pass defense in the league. And, and that's what you're going to get when you have that kind of aggressive scheme when you're rushing seven a lot, playing cover zero and blitzing a ton. But they did retool the secondary. Two former first-round draft picks. How does Von Hutchins do this? You got Gary on Conley and DeAndre Baker. You add him to Mike Joseph. I think the secondary will be okay. D.C., in a close one. This one reminds me of week one against Seattle last season, but it's on the road this time. Um, from a betting perspective, it's a high total. I kind of lean the under. Zook, you know me. I'm not going to bet the under because there is some bias involved here. I don't want to get to a point where DC needs a winning touchdown and it's going to lose me a bet. <laughs> So we're going to stay off the under. Take it if you're not a D.C. fan. I think the defense could be good in this. I don't even want to know here, Zook. I, I, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> here See, we I, are. I might not have seen Arlington coming. I, I thought you were going to go Renegades earlier in the show, but I, I know where you're going here. This, this is just setting itself up too nicely for you. San Antonio. Hey, 
I think they are the most improved over last year for the XFL. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, they just upgrading coaches. I'll miss Heinz Ward, but like, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, not not the best for like the first year guys. So last my question year. to you yeah. is, did Arlington create a blueprint on how to beat D.C.? No. You don't think so? No, I don't think so, because... Well, when Luis Perez was in that Player 54 documentary drawing the play on the hotel window with a dry erase marker, mm-hmm. I don't know. To me, Luis Perez is just like, I don't think he sleeps. <laughs> I really don't. A.J. Smith, though, he's, he's another one of those like uh, cerebral football guys. I just think, and, and from some of the, the reports that I've heard in, in practices and scrimmages, San Antonio has a long way to go to install this offense. It's a hard offense to run this air raid. There's only a couple plays, but it seems to me like the teams that run the ball out of the gate might be better. Right. I don't know. I just, I feel like DC talking into it now. huh? No, not, (laughs) not at all. DC missing Abram Smith is just too much. I don't think their read option game is going to be as good. I don't think their run game is going to be as good. And that's all they did was lean on that last year. Um, Yeah. It the, scares me with Jordan how many carries he's going to need to take. Right. The threat of the run really yeah. opened up that offense for those guys like Lucky. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and DC, DC was also the beneficiary of a lot of missed tackles last year. Right. Uh, hopefully that's cleaner. So I'm taking San Antonio. Yeah, the defense is no joke. I, I think this will be something like a 24 to 18 DC. I, I think a couple of points here or there, but. Yeah, that it, it, it's weird with the defenders' offense because with the guys they have, I, I think they could actually potentially be even better than they were last year, which is crazy to say. But, like, we don't know how Kiki QT is going to be. And a lot of these other receivers, Brandon Smith could break out, and they got a really good tight end with, with Caden Smith and, and a good tight end room. So I'm hoping my D.C. defenders will get out of week one, one and oh, and then we can come party in Audi Field. Closing out the weekend is the lone USFL matchup on the card. It's Houston hosting Memphis. Spread is a coin flip here. Uh, Showboats, the one-point favorite, and I think that's that's four for four road favorites. You would not see that in the NFL, I'll tell you that. Uh, totals are lowest of the week, 41. Forecast for H-Town, 80 and cloudy with 15 to 25 mile an hour winds. Bad day for the kickers down there in Texas. So first, let's check out the Memphis offense against the Houston defense. You see him here, Case Cookus. And his head coach, John Filippo, who I think Zook will be rooting for a lot this year. This was a guy who won the Super Bowl as a quarterback's coach for Zook's Philadelphia Eagles. He was, he was on that squad. Who's that? Big Dick Nick, let's go. Nick, hey, don't forget Carson Wentz too, man. Came in that year as a starter, and uh, D. Filippo works <laughs> works some miracles here. Uh, he'll he'll work that offense this year with offensive coordinator Doug Martin, who, if you're a college football nerd like me, you remember him from the near decade he spent with the New Mexico State Aggies. So, what do we know about Case Cookus? This was a guy who was. Super high in demand in the USFL draft uh, once they announced that the Philly Stars would not be returning. I think Cookus probably would have gone to Michigan with his old OC, Marcel Belfay, but Memphis got him first. It's all about that draft order. I'm telling you that that's going to end up being more important than people think. I'm sure Houston was another team that was looking at Cookus in the draft uh usfl folks love this kid everything i've heard has been positive out of their camp but i gotta go back and i I gotta do some more homework on case cook is because as an xfl show last year we will kind of be introduced to the chef for the first time this season i think on paper if he can limit his interceptions he had nine of them last year he could be one of the better quarterbacks obviously in the usfl conference and 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 lead memphis to that second place bid I think Birmingham is going to be pretty much a lock to win the USFL conference, but Memphis can make some noise and, and possibly get to the playoffs. Um, I love this offensive staff. I can tell you right now, John D. Filippo has coached so many NFL quarterbacks over the years, nearly 20 years in the NFL, and Doug Martin around for decades in college football as well. So always good to have OCs with head coaching experience. That's 
that's super important. And as far as how Cookus and company match up with the Houston defense, I expect kind of almost like a, a big 10, two yards in a cloud of dust, knock them down, drag them out, maybe a first one to 20 kind of rock fight here between these two teams because Darius Victor, the running back for Memphis, is a workhorse. And I think they'll look to him to get a ton of carries in week one. Houston defense led by defensive coordinator Chris Wilson. Um, They are a little banged up in the front seven. So keep an eye on that when injury reports become official here soon. Um, They they may have some guys that that can't go. Don't want to make anything official yet, but the Houston team's a little banged up. Um, and, And we'll touch on a guy who's hurt on their offensive side of the ball as well that might make you want to stay away. Uh, the impact player on the defense for me here is Reuben Foster, former first-round NFL draft pick out of Alabama. Uh, I still give a slight edge to the Memphis offense here under Cookus. He has experience against this scheme. Remember, guys, the Houston Roughnecks are not the Houston Roughnecks of last year. These are the Houston Gamblers rebranded. And I almost wonder, Zook, how many Roughnecks fans are going to show up that haven't paid a lick of attention to the UFL in the offseason. They're in a new stadium, and all of a sudden they they look around. (laughs) Where'd everybody go? This ain't the Roughnecks. Like, I don't know how they're going to react if they haven't paid attention to this merge. It's going to be kind of funny. I don't think the gamblers are as good as the Roughnecks. Nonetheless, really good receiving core here for Memphis. They were kind of imported from the New Orleans Breakers, where... DeFilippo coached last year. And if you're trying to get familiar with the with the USFL side of things and you're more of an XFL fan, the showboats are a lot like the Brahmas in that Wade Phillips went from Houston to San Antonio. DeFilippo went from New Orleans to Memphis and brought almost everybody from the Breakers over with them. Uh, for Houston, head coach Curtis Johnson is staying with offensive coordinator Eric Price. So let's look at the Houston offense now against that Memphis defense. Um, Price and and, and Johnson coached together at Tulane. And believe it or not, Eric Price is actually a guy who was the offensive coordinator at Alabama for his dad in the pre-Saban days of the Crimson Tide. And I think that's why he's going to end up going with an SEC guy at quarterback, named the starter for Houston, Jarrett Garantano. Fun fact, back in 2017, Garantano took over for a young Quentin Dormady when he went out with a shoulder injury at Tennessee. So really a ton of former SEC quarterbacks in in, in this league as a whole. Corral, Tamu, McCarron, Danny Etling. There's there's a lot of guys. So if you're a fan of that conference, you're going to enjoy the UFL in 2024. You'll get some recognizable names just means more. So back into Houston, the skill positions. Let's talk about running back Mark Thompson, who returns as the USFL Offensive Player of the Year. Now, proceed with caution on Thompson if you're a better and you like DFS because he was banged up in camp and he's not expected to play. We did not get official confirmation on that, but Mark Thompson I would list as doubtful for week one. He joins Jacor Pearson and Abram Smith. It's just a shame to see all these guys that won't play in week one. Uh, but this is an opportunity for Tyon Evans out of Louisville and TJ Pledger, who will split carries in that Houston backfield. And they're going to feed those guys. Uh, this, is a, this is a run first kind of operation. I do still give the edge to the Memphis defense under DC Carnell Lake. Uh, the boats are led by Vontae Diggs, who. It is a flashy guy. Uh, definitely wears his heart on his sleeve. He actually had a quote recently in an article on UFL board. And he said, and I quote, the rivalry between the XFL and USFL is 100% real and always will be. Those guys think they're better. Quite frankly, we're better. End quote. So I guess we won't find out, Vontae, till week two when you take on San Antonio. <laughs> but uh, we'll see We'll see if you can cover Cody Latimer in that one. Uh, Max Roberts, another standout guy on this Memphis defense. He was a star for Vegas as a pass rusher last year. 
he'll get to the quarterback often. Uh, leaning towards the Memphis defense to keep Houston under 20. That's that's kind of my lean in this game. Garantano, though, listen, he's the right choice. I mean, a lot of people were surprised that he was named the starter over Reed Sinet. He, he He's the right choice. He'll get comfortable with this system in time. Uh, he has the talent to make a playoff push. And actually, I think, really, looking, watching Garantano in college, uh, he's right up there with Matt Corral as far as potential. Uh, played some NFL preseason ball. It's been a while, but, you know, it, it was a while for a lot of these guys that, that hadn't hadn't started a whole season even AJ hadn't started a whole season before he came back to the UFL so watch out for Jared I, I, I'm confident in him um, but the, the boats are the play here in week one D Filippo's breakers I think last year beat the Houston gamblers twice so they already have their number in this matchup and I think that trend continues here on Sunday Zook Memphis and Houston close us out who you got uh. You have a coin? You want to flip it? Toss it. <laughs> I just feel like, I don't know. This one's tough. I'm taking Houston. I'm not sure why. I, I... See, I left the tape on your desk a couple months ago. It was actually a little CD. It said USFL 2023 season. I wonder how much of that you got through. Uh, unfortunately, not I, was, a lot. I was not able to work through all of it without falling asleep. Yeah, but... I was just going to say not a lot. It wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> I um, fast forward to the end. I watched the championship. And I feel bad for saying that, but it's true. We love USFL fan, fans. Do we? Yeah, I think we do. If you're watching our show. I guess we'll we, find out. Yeah. I, <laughs> after I, I after tonight, we're going to find out if we really like them or not. Or not. Yeah. But Well, you're going Houston, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm taking them slight edge. Flip a coin. Not sure. You like the under? Uh, you're staying away from my theory, which was I, when two bad teams play. Take the under. Yeah, and it, <laughs> it's silly. I don't like the t- – I, I, I said earlier, I don't like totals. Yeah. Um, and They're same thing. Sharp. Yeah. This this could go either way. I don't, I, this is a stay-away bet game for me. I'm not touching it at all. Yeah, I added it kind of late. Uh, I like the boats, I think. I think Houston's a little banged up, so keep an eye on that. that that's all I'll say there. So that's it for our game previews. Again, proceed – with caution in week one if you have a unit we don't unit shame play a quarter of it it's a little nickel this time around not the whole dollar because uh we don't know anything uh and the cool part about that is neither does vegas so maybe an opportunity if if you're sharp but uh for our straight picks and again these are not best bets we're going to get to that in a second these are just straight picks For me, it's Arlington, St. Louis, D.C., and Memphis. For Zook, it's Birmingham, St. Louis, San Antonio, and Houston. Three of four different. And I think you probably watched last year's show, Zook, and you were like, too many times we were on top of it. We did really well with our straight picks. And we were together on a lot of those. But you're you're not going to go with that this year. Like you said, week one is... uh... It's tough. I, we have no product to watch. We don't really know. Yeah. There's just too many, ugh. like you said, quarter units. I'm betting full <laughs> units. Ooh. But, but you, <laughs> Let's go. Out there, you should probably stay away. At least go half, half of your normal unit. You're just doing that so they don't limit you like they did last year when you were killing it. Of course, Zook was the championship of our best bets contest. He went seven and three. Last year, he would love for me to mention that. Uh, we won't talk about my record. It was it was 500, so say that much. It was good enough. 500 is nothing to sneeze at when you're when you're gambling. Yeah. And you know what? I normally won't toot your horn at all, ever, never. I, I, I don't even like saying that I could do it. Yeah. But 500 is pretty damn good when you're gambling. Wasn't the worst on the show. I guess it depends on... <laughs> yeah it depends uh, on the units and i think at the end right. of the year your units went up and you did better well if you followed along with us last year we visited seven of the eight xfl stadiums on our boulevard bowl tour which was so much fun one of the, the best parts of doing the show we got out to the north division title game we covered the championship in the alamo dome so we're thrilled to announce in 2024 We have our Spring Ball Boulevard 
Battle of the Brands Tour. We talked about crossover matchups a lot so far in this show. I'm going to travel the country to find out which spring football league ends up with bragging rights, which at the end of the day might hold just as much weight as that UFL championship to some of these guys. We have Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia's XFL up against Fox's USFL. This tour is going to exclusively visit crossover matchups. Again, there's 16 of them this year. We'll get to about four or five of those in different cities. And it's obvious where we're heading in week one. Back to UFL HQ in Arlington for a clash of the champions on Saturday. Stallions, Renegades, Skip Holtz, and Bob Stoops meeting for the first time since 2014, where Boomer Sooner took down La Tech. I think it was like 48 to 10 or something. I mean, obviously Bob Stoops was was coaching at the Power Five level. Uh, but I'll be cooking up some content from that one Saturday. Uh, follow along, Matty Fresh TV on X in real time. And then we'll have a little recap of the trip for you Sunday night. I'll be out there with the people. So if you're heading to Arlington, it's going to be much warmer than last year's opener. We're looking at 80s. I think last year's opener against Vegas in Arlington was 36 and cloudy. So I'm excited to get out of the Northeast and head down to the Lone Star State. We'll see you for the 2024 Battle of the Brands Tour. And with that, our favorite part of the program, Boulevard Best Bets. This is why we're here. We love betting on the UFL. We believe that there is an edge that you can gain on the sports books that you don't get in other leagues. And I just went on a terrible March Madness <laughs> betting run, so I'm ready to make some money. You're trying to you're trying to uh, flip that scale. When you have something that everybody watches, it's so hard to win. Basketball's tough, man. It, it, I, everybody's I to betting away. the tournament. The lines are rock solid. We it's have horrible. no idea. And I was like three and nine on the tournament, but. That's Ouch. that's last weekend. This is Spring Ball Boulevard now. It, it, it's football season, baby. We know you're probably watching the Sweet 16 in a little split screen with us. But uh, let's let's give you some UFL best bets. If you listen to some of my recaps, or not recaps, but previews, you probably know where I'm going with these already. Yeah, Mr. XFL over here sticking with Arlington plus three and a half. I'm fading the public. I, I, I don't believe that this game uh, will be a four-point game. I, I believe Arlington can get inside of three. I believe they can win this game outright. Again, I'm all in on Luis Perez in the second year of the system this year. I get your point, Zook, that Arlington struggled out of the gate, but that was with Drew Plitt and Kyle Sloter. That was not with Luis Perez. He is back with a vengeance, and you already know these first 20 plays. Tonight, he's running through his head saying, what's this Birmingham defense going to line up as? Right. I think for Birmingham, I get a vibe of a lot of good players, but they said that about Vegas last year, all these NFL guys, and they just didn't gel together. Like I know they won two championships with this staff, but these players were not there for a lot of those. So I'm going Arlington at home plus three and a half. I'm also going to take St. Louis uh, minus the six and a half. That is my hammer of the week. If, if you like a play where maybe you want to play a full unit, it's St. Louis. That one will not be close. I'm going to add bo uh, boats and butts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> showboats no, the boats the showboats uh, money line i think case cook is um just just has played a lot more spring football than jared garantano who's entering as as uh kind of a practice squad nfl guy and again houston with some injuries on defense uh, i feel like the boats can get it done here in a tight one uh that's a coin flip do we even have to talk about yours here? Man. Yeah, absolutely. Killing so, me. I mean, I'm only going with one play because I'm going to be a little more conservative week one. I'm not a degenerate like you. I'm going to do this all year. <laughs> Are you, it's just fade fresh, right? Hashtag fade fresh. No, I'm not really fading you. I just, I picked oh. what I wanted. And yeah. uh, if you, you might have mentioned it earlier, my record was better than yours. Uh, oh, did I say that out loud? Yeah. Did I say that out loud? My bad. Uh, so I'll take uh, Birmingham minus three and a half. I just think it's a solid play. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, I think they have the most approved. Uh, they're going to come out. They're coming out. They're going to ball. Does the quarterback situation concern you? Do, you? do you trust that, that that could be Matt Corral kind of emerging 
as one of the better quarterbacks. I mean, he is. He was a, what, second or third round pick? I think he was a second round pick with Carolina. Something like that, yeah. That doesn't worry you day one. No. Okay. I don't know. Arlington. I, I'm trying to pick your brain here. Of what Arlington snuck into the playoffs, got hot, won a championship. Um, Birmingham favored gate to gate. Yeah. Opening day, they got it twice in a row. I, I just think that carries more weight. Arlington. Yeah. I'm not. No disrespect. I'm not throwing shade, but. Birmingham should win this game. I do respect your commitment to following what odds makers are giving us as title futures. Right. Right. Birmingham at three to one. Now, the one thing I'll push back on, are they three to one because they're number one in the league or are they three and one, three to one because they're pretty much a lock to win their conference and are probably going to be there in St. Louis at the end of the year? Cause that, that's a conversation like power rankings versus odds. Sure. Are, are we I mean, separating here? A little valid bit? point. I don't think so. Don't it's going to be a close game, right? It's it's going to be a, a really close game. Uh, the clash of champions here, two great coaching staffs. I think I don't think it's quite the game of the weekend. Actually, I think DC San Antonio will. I agree with that. Will be awesome uh, to see on on Easter Sunday. I kind mean, of a bummer for the Brahmas fans having to go in there at eleven a.m. on Easter. I want a little more cheese, or else I would just take the Stallions' money line. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I took a little extra. But yeah. I, I, I think they can give three and a half. It's fine. I'll give you a bonus if, if you like this sort of thing. Uh, St. Louis and D.C. money line, if you put those together, you might get it at, like, minus 130. I was looking at that. If you like those sort of things where you, like, tease a, a little two-legger, look at, look at St. Louis and D.C. money line um, this weekend. All right, well, new to Spring Ball Boulevard this year, we welcome the People's Gambler. He is here as our resident DFS expert for the season. He's going to give you a player to start, a player to sit, and a low-price, high-value guy that everybody might be sleeping on. That starts now. Stardom, Matt Corral. The former Old Miss quarterback and third round pick for the Panthers will look to make the start for the Birmingham Stallion squad who are loaded with talent on both sides of the ball. With many returning receivers and a high powered offense like Birmingham, Corral has tremendous upside for your DFS lineup. This could be a perfect opportunity for him to redeem himself and prove to the public that he belongs back in the NFL. Start, Matt Corral. Sit him, Wayne Gallman. A name synonymous with fantasy football owners, Goldman, who won the starting job after a strong camp, enters an offense which posted the highest overall pass rate at 64% in the XFL last season. With Hakeem Butler and Darius Shepard also in the mix, I believe these two will have the majority of offense production on Saturday as McCarron is no stranger to throwing those two the ball. Sit, Wayne Goldman. Sleeper, Chris Rowland. The speedy receiver will look to make an immediate impact in the passing game with the absence of Chris Blair and Lucky Jackson. With Jordan Tiamu entering his second season in the DC offense, don't be surprised to see this team take a more pass-happy approach after the recent injury to Abram Smith. DC led the XFL in points scored last season, and with a dynamic route runner in Roland, look for this guy to rack up catches quickly. Sleeper, Chris Roland. Follow me on Twitter at peoples underscore gambler for my full DFS lineup, and we'll see you next week. Zook, I saw you scratching some things down on your notepad there, getting your lineup ready. I think Zook's going to dip his toe in some DFS this year, especially when I tell him first place, 50K, and you don't got to pay that much to enter. So go to DraftKings, hop on the DFS. The contest is live. Keep an eye on injuries because there are some guys who have injury designations on the, on the DFS contests um, that aren't actually hurt and some guys that are left off that are. So make sure you always do your research with that. Um, there's some great content creators. We believe, as far as DFS goes, the people's gambler is the guy. So go shoot him a follow. 
and win some money. Well, that's going to be all she wrote for us here tonight on the Boulevard. Before you head out, of course, drop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. We hope you enjoyed the multi-platform uh, show we're going to bring you this year. And of course, on Sunday nights, we're going to bring you an NFL primetime style live highlight show going over all the day's action. And that's going to be wherever you see us tonight. We also want to say, if Zook will change his mind on who he wants to be his team, drop a comment below. Never. And, and tell him who you want him to root for, right? He's eventually going to have to root for somebody other than against D.C. Uh, I think he's still thinking about it, but drop a comment. And listen, I, I want to remind everyone before, before we sign off tonight, Zook, I'm making a list this year. I, I'm taking down names. I'm like Chris Jericho up in here this year. A lot of noise, a lot of noise from that USFL side chirping already. And they were not happy when Pat McAfee buried them on national television. They're, they're crawling back out of that. And, and it, was, it was at Radio Row at the Super Bowl, too. So in front of a national audience, The Rock was sitting right there. He was nodding along in agreement. I'll leave it at that. It's a big weekend for both sides. We do know that to be a thing. I'm Matty Fresh. Go ahead and enjoy the Sweet 16 and the rest of MLB opening day. It's an exciting part of the sports calendar. But always remember, there is no such thing as football season. We'll see you Sunday.